guys have to tell me when we're live. We're live? They said we're live. Oh, hi. <laughs> Welcome to Real Guitar Live. Sorry we're starting late, a minor emergency, but we're here and we really are live. And we have today Vince Malone. Uh, this is a real treat. And today the training is going to be a finger picking and beyond the basic basics. So I'll put a link if you're really just brand new beginner and finger picking and give you some stuff that you can get started on. But please stay tuned. We got, we're going to answer your questions after this. And we're also going to do a drawing at the end of this for all the members of Real Guitar Success at the end of the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Vince, take it away. Great. This, the audience is here. Hello, everybody. Thanks, uh, Thomas, for having me. Um, so, so today we're just going to talk about some basic finger picking um, ideas, um, but beyond just the basic uh, thumb, index, middle, ring finger. I'll go over that just for people who are maybe not comfortable with that, and then we'll get into the meat of the conversation, uh, taking it a step beyond that. So for, uh, for people who out there who are not sure exactly what finger picking is, it's obviously uh, it's picking the strings with your fingers as opposed to picking with a pick, but more specifically uh, using uh, certain fingers with certain strings. Um, the main rules basically are that your thumb covers the sixth string, fifth string, or fourth string. So if we were playing like a G chord, your thumb often would just play the sixth string, the bass, bass note of the chord. And then the index finger covers any notes that will be played on the third string. The middle finger will cover any notes on the second string. And then our ring finger covers any notes on the first string. This is often called finger picking, finger style, Travis picking, um, classical guitar players, uh, Pima, P-I-M-A. Um, P-I-M-A. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I'll give you just a basic pattern again. If we're playing like a G chord, often the thumb will play the lowest note of the chord, the bass note. So we'll play the sixth string, and then our index finger, third, middle will be second, and ring will be first. So just a basic. And if we go to a chord like C, the bass note changes to the fifth string. But our index, middle, and ring stay on those on their respective strings. Um, Another kind of basic part of finger picking is alternate bass, and that's the idea of where your, your low note will um, change, and it's basically on the beat. If we did it with our uh, the G chord, it would be, and then often go to the fourth string. Um, with the C chord, it would go to the fourth string. So our, our thumb would be going fifth string, and then four string. And the example that we're going to get into with Dust in the Wind, it is alternate bass. Um, and that's where we can get into some issues with right hand in, in terms of following the exact guideline rules of, of finger style. So the finger picking for Dust in the Wind, would you say it's, it's a common pattern? I mean, it's something that even if you weren't necessarily wanting to learn that song, it's a pattern that you could use in other areas? Very much so. I find it very common in a lot of songs. I wouldn't say it's the like a beginning pattern, so to speak. Yeah. Um, it, it uses 16th notes. If you're just starting with finger picking, you probably want to just start with quarter note pattern, kind of like the first example yeah. I showed. Yeah, and I'll uh, put a link to some of the simpler things yeah. for anybody there, but yeah, they, they've been warned. Yeah. <laughs> One of the you, you may you may have heard the first pattern. And you might be saying, Thomas Vince, why can't I just use a pick for that? And we would say, Well, you could, but uh, for the, the advantage of finger picking is that you can also grab two strings at the same time on non-adjacent strings. Right. So it really opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, and I like to tell my students that you can sound pretty fancy without af actually having to be like a, an advanced student. Mm -hmm. um, so for Dust in the Wind, the, we're all probably familiar with the introduction. It revolves around a C chord and an A minor chord. Okay, yeah. C major, folk style. 
whoa. And A minor. With, I see you got some pinky action there. Yeah, it goes to a lot of variations. First chord, C major. Second chord, C major seven. Picking up our first finger. And then C at nine. Ah, the pinky there on the second string, third fret. Yeah. And this follows the general finger picking rules where our thumb is playing the bass note of the C chord fifth string. And then some of the other notes are we're remaining true with our right hand pattern, index on the third, middle on the second. The alternate bass with the C chord. You can see my thumb is going back and forth between fifth string and fourth string. That's really common with alternate bass, especially with chords like C where your bass note is on the fifth string. Also with A minor, same exact thing. Bass notes on the fifth string. So the alternate bass is going from yeah. fifth to fourth. Same as the C chord. Yeah. Um, bass note chords uh, that are on the sixth string, like G, you know, sometimes it varies with the alternate bass. Sometimes you'll go from sixth to fourth, sometimes sixth to fifth. In this case, we do go sixth to fifth. Now the passage that we're gonna get into, this is where we go beyond these basic steps, is the verse section of Dust in the Wind. The verse section starts on a C chord, follows this very common pattern that, that we were talking about used in many other songs. Goes to a G with B in the bass. If you haven't played this chord before, you could think of it like a, like a big G chord and just getting rid of your low bass note. And, and instead playing, yeah, instead of just playing the B as your bass note. So this is a very cool descending bass line. We've got C, B, and then A minor. And then we come to the problem. We go to a G chord, not a big deal. And then we go to this chord, D minor 7. Not the most common chord. The partial bar. <laughs> it's like an F chord without, um, with an open four string. And the reason why it's an issue is because all of a sudden we're playing our first chord in the song where the bass note is on the fourth string. And all of a sudden our alternate bass is going to be on the fourth string and third string. And the third string is supposed to be property of the index finger. So it totally messes up our right hand pattern. And I, for the first, like, I don't know, five or six years of teaching this song, I tried to just keep my pattern within the rules of finger picking, which um, I won't even go into because I don't even want you to do it. Uh, but we want to try, I think, it's, it's smarter to keep that right hand pattern exactly the same, even though we will be technically breaking some of the rules of finger picking. So, um, basic rules. The, so the chord before is G major. Um, all we really need is the bass note, so sometimes you'll see me just grab the bass note. I'm playing um, sixth string and second string, doing my alternate bass on the fourth string with this pattern. Um, I won't go into the patterns. Um, you could find easily online the, the right hand pattern on all sorts of websites. Um, I won't plug them, but you can just type it into Google. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll put in a link. I have a, okay. I have a video with that pattern. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'll put it in the description when we're done, a couple days. And after the G, we jump to this D minor 7, the aforementioned D minor 7. Thumb grabs the fourth string, and then instead of my ring finger on the first string, I'm using my middle finger because I'm just taking my all my fingers in, my, in the typical pattern, the rules I described earlier in the video, in the, in the live streaming, and I'm just moving everything over one. And that's just to keep the consistency with the right hand. It's just a lot easier to keep that consistency than, than, than really mess with it. And then with the D minor seven, it would be thumb and middle on the first string. And then my alternate bass kicks in on the third string. And that's, that's the, the part that doesn't fit with the rules, really. But if you move everything down one, it actually feels really natural. And then we come out of it into an A minor. Once you're back in the A minor, your bass note's on the fifth string, and then you're just into a regular alternate bass between the, the fifth and fourth. And I've noticed that, that that situation comes up a lot because you run into a lot of songs when you're finger picking and you, with chords that the bass note's on the fourth string, hmm. whether it's a D major or a D minor or an F chord and you can't do your normal finger picking rules if you're doing an alternate bass and like we were talking about that's a 
the pattern that's used in this song is extremely common. So a lot of people ask me how to know what bass note to play for what chord when you're finger picking. Mm -hmm. So I've heard you say for like a G chord, and if you see that the bass note is on the low sixth string, use that plus yes. an alternate that could be the next string next to it, the fifth. Yeah. For the C chord, A minor chords where the bass is on the fifth string, that and the bass note next to it. Fourth, yeah. But when you get to like a D or D minor seven or D minor, yeah. then you're gonna have to move down to the fourth string yeah. and, and the third. Is the other bass note. Yeah, the third will be the alternate bass, and okay. if you want to just use these three fingers for that for your right hand approach, instead of using, including also your your ring finger, which is usually what we use for our first finger, and that's I think that's the way to go when you're dealing with those specific chords with the bass note on the fourth string. Hey Vince, we have a viewer and hi everybody. This is on me by the way. No mic today, but I'm in the abyss. She's here. <laughs> um, we have a viewer and who says. Okay, hold the presses. <laughs> hold how, the press! How did you play that B? It didn't look like a bar chord B. Please tell me how you did that. The B? Yeah. Um, the, B. the G, it's, it's actually, and it's actually called a G with a B in the bass. If you ever see it written in music, it'll be a G slash B. Um, a lot of times when, when my students are learning basic songs and they see a, a chord like that, G slash B, I say just play a G because it's, it's basically a G chord. The way that it translates into English is a G chord with B in the bass. So what I was doing was taking a regular old G chord, and then the B note is on the fifth string, and that will become the lowest note of the chord. So we, we call this chord right here G with B in the bass. Yeah. Often I come at that, I think of it, as a C, and I'm looking at the bass note, yeah. I gotta get that bass note down one step. Mm -hmm. And so I just move my second finger over and take the third finger off and I put the pinky down because yep. then I don't have to shift everything around. Exactly. Of course, it's just habit. If, if I'm used to this, that's what I would do because that would be easier for me because I'm used to it. So it looks like I'm going from a C, but in fact, I usually see it written as a G slash B, mm -hmm. a G with a B in the bass. In other words, this is usually the bass note on the G, but you avoid that and go right to the B. You could put your finger down there, you just don't use it. Yeah, you could. And when I teach it, usually I do approach it from starting with a G and then, and then just taking off that bass note. But to your point, I, I think the more applicable, when people use it, especially in finger picking, they only usually use their first and third finger or second and pinky. And dust in the wind coming off of a C chord, I think, Second and pinky is probably probably the friendliest finger, and even though it uses it's the one I'm used the, to the dreaded pinky. Um, the one thing I've learned over the years, both in playing and teaching, there is no absolutely one right way to do everything. A lot of it has to do with what you're used to. But yeah. you know, if you're just starting out, sometimes there's some things that are a little better to get used to than others. And I think that's kind of the whole the whole premise behind this talk is there's there's these hard and fast rules about finger picking. You'll see them in classical music and folk style. Um, but when you, when you encounter certain situations, don't be afraid to adapt them. Um, and that's the idea with, uh, with that D, um, with the alternate bass. So I think it's a, a better idea to adapt it and quote unquote break the rules. Good question, Ann. Yeah. I realize it might be coming from a place where many students are struggling with a B chord when they come up to it because it's one of the harder ones. So she saw, she saw a B, yeah. B, uh, no bar chord. Yeah, How do you yeah. do that? Luckily, it's not a B major chord, so we're yeah. okay. Okay. Um, the other thing that I noticed is that, and again, this falls into that's not absolutely one right way to do things. I was, uh, I studied classical guitar for years, even though I was, brought up a rocker to start. I said, I gotta go to college and study classical. And so I had to take lessons first. And boy, they drilled in my head not to rest my hand when I'm finger picking. <laughs> but most, every electric guitar player and rock player, or even finger style, folk finger style does that. Either plants the finger here. And I've heard teachers say, yeah, for, plant your finger so you. So of course, if, if I were telling my classical guitar teacher, I'd, I'd probably, uh, uh, I'd probably have, he'd probably tell me, no, that's the wrong way to do it. But it works, and it works for lots of people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a hard and fast rule. As a matter of fact, I find myself sometimes when I'm 
playing something for demonstration and, and teaching. I do that because I can't afford to take a mistake and I can't look at my fingers. Yeah. <laughs> so if I plant my hand, I know where I'm at. I can feel it. If I'm floating, I, I have to look. <laughs> yeah. And I've had, I've had people say the same thing, like, oh, you can't plant your, you know, if you're picking. And then I look at pictures of uh, Hendrix and Jimmy Page and I'm like, Wait a second. They're Who's going to tell it. them they don't know how to do it right? <laughs> so if, if it's cool with the Jimmys, then it's, it's okay with me. Uh, okay, so I think we're ready for some more questions. We have some ahead of time. Is there any questions that relate directly to this that we could deal with? Yeah, so Larry just said, uh, what did he say about playing the D chord? Okay. Oh. So the, the main point, this was a D minor 7. This is a hard chord for a lot of students early in the game. It's because of this partial bar. I like to use this as a stepping stone to doing the F chord because it eliminates one finger so you can kind of focus on the bar thing. And I usually yeah. teach get that little bar first so you're having to press two strings at once on the first fret. Then you stretch your second finger over and once you can do that, the F is it's an easy step from there. D minor seven. You could substitute just a, a D minor as yeah. well. That would. As a matter of fact, when I first learned this, because it wasn't accurate, I was doing the D minor. Yeah. I, I think my friends, that's the chords they could play, so that's what they showed me. It sounds good. It totally yeah. works. But but it is. It, 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 they're actually using a, a D minor seven on the on the recording. Yeah. Yes. No, the point with the D minor was the what we were talking about was the alternate bass with the yeah. with the D minor our lowest notes on the fourth string. And when we do an alternate bass, our thumb, our thumb will move from the lowest note of the chord, which for the D minor is the fourth string, and then alternate over one string to the third string. And, and we had talked about in, earlier on that the third string is supposed to be picked with the index finger, but to stay in the pattern of all the other chords that are played prior in this song, we end up just using our thumb on the fourth, and then also using our thumb on the third. And that's where we're adapting those finger picking rules to, to fit this particular situation. And when you use your thumb, you're using, it looks like a little more the side of your thumb to get the bass note. A little bit, a little bit. I, you, know, I know, you know, I studied classical as well. And you insist just, on nails. <laughs> yeah, my nail's a little bit, a little bit uh, short right now, but I, I do try to hit it a little bit right where the, the nail meets the, ah. meets the skin, I think. At least that's what my classical teacher told me. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, in classical guitar, the nails serve to give a little more brightness to the sound. Of course, you're using nylon strings, so that really counts. But steel strings doesn't make a big a difference because steel strings are bright to start Anyways. with. Yeah. Cool. We have some questions from folks. Okay. Um, these are folks who submitted questions ahead of time. And for those of you that are watching live, start typing in your questions now in the live chat so we can address them. Um, so Shulamit says, now that I've mastered the bar chords, when do I use them? When should bar chords be substituted for open chords, or when the, when should they be combined in a song with open chords? Is there an advantage of bar chords over open chords, except in instances such as the F chord that there's no other way to play it? Um, it, it depends on the situation. Uh, it's a good question, though. If you're learning a specific song, um, you want to probably stay as true to that song as possible. So if they're using open chords combined with bar chords, then you just want to mimic that. If you're writing your own songs, then... And she is. I know she'll limit. She's yeah. writing her own songs. Okay. Then that's totally a, a personal thing. There's no right or wrong. It's just different flavors of, of what works for you. Um, so bar chords do sound different than open chords. Yeah. So for example, here's a D open chord. It takes advantage of this open D string, and you could even hit the fifth string. It has a kind of a broad open sound. I can play that same D chord right here. It sounds different. It's higher in pitch. I'm blocked all the strings with my first finger, so there's no open, there's no notes as low as the open strings here. Uh, and there's no note as low as this A right here. But if I were playing some chords, bar chords up in here, want to drop all the way down here and change the texture of the chords. Yeah. It'd be a total different sound from these other bar chords I'm playing. Or it's kind of like the strummy stuff you're doing. If you're doing some type of muting, so like, um, um, yeah. 
if you're playing like bar chords, your, your fingers are already across all the strings. So you can play uh, chords and mute really easily because you're just releasing the pressure here and then you can mute the strings if you're using that type of technique. And I do, if I, for me personally, if I can use open chords, I, I like the sound of open chords whenever I can just because I think they resonate differently with the open strings in comparison. Especially if you're doing some finger style stuff. Yeah. The open chords really, they're full, they, they resonate. And I had kind of an open chord epiphany when I was uh, studying uh, ACDC, actually. Uh, there are all these books when I was growing up teaching ACDC, and they were teaching it with bar chords. And I would be, play the song written in these, in these song books, and it wouldn't sound exactly right. And then I finally saw a correct tab where they were playing all their bar chords as open chords, so like an A major chord, or they played as an A5. They would always play it. Oh, you mean ACDC was using open chords? All oh, there are power chords, but yeah. they're open power chords like an A5, as opposed to it just has a different resonance. Especially uh, yeah, you know, you know, like ACDC has that little bit of a distorted tone, so it just it just has a really big sound. And after learning that, I was like, I could just really hear the difference between fretted, you know, those fretted notes and open notes, and I, and I really have leaned towards open chords when I can. Unless it's a specific song I'm learning, then, then I may use bar chords. Would you say, I'm just thinking this, I, I never had this thought before that I remember, on the acoustic guitar, for the most part, most of the time you're gonna use open chords if you possibly can, except for chords that you can't make with open chords, like an F and B. a B, <laughs> B flat. Yeah. Um, but other than that, if you can use the open chord, because you're not really usually playing way up in here unless you're really advanced and doing some advanced yeah. finger style stuff. Yeah, the reson I mean, the, the resonation really, uh, I think, is more important with the acoustic yeah. guitar. With the electric guitar, if you want the notes to sustain, you just you know turn yeah. up your. You got the amp. You turn up your volume with acoustic guitar. And there is an advantage to move around open chords because you can keep the same chord form and move very quickly from one to the other. Sure. But it works on electric because of the amplification. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the open notes will ring long, a little bit longer. Yeah. Good question. Very cool. Okay, we have Joseph who says, uh, when I practice, should I practice slow or as fast as I can uh, or that my fingers will let me? <laughs> good, good. Yeah, very important question. <laughs> very important uh, question. <laughs> and, and probably one of the harder ones for, for everyone, including myself, uh, to pay attention to because when we hear a song, or something, we want to play it just like we hear it. So we just want to play it at, at tempo. Uh, but usually that's just not realistic uh, for anybody uh, learning a new song. So what you want to do is slow it down to the slowest possible speed where you can play it perfectly. No mistakes. Yep. Um, and if you can play through the passage perfectly, switch chords perfectly without making any mistakes, then you found your tempo. If you need to go slower, it doesn't matter. Go as slow as you need to do. And it's basically because we're, tra we're training our muscles. Uh, playing guitar or any instrument is, is like a sport, it's, it's muscle memory. So if you learn a song and you play it fast and it has little mistakes in it, then your finger, you're teaching your, those muscles how to make mistakes basically. And that's how you're always gonna play it. If you take it slow enough to where you're playing it perfectly, even if it's slow and it's frustrating and it doesn't sound like the song, once you get it perfect, you can start to bump up the tempo slowly, and your muscles will remember what you were doing. And it's it's crazy. I didn't believe it at first for many years. I didn't listen to my teacher, but yeah. you'll you'll <laughs> you'll remember your, the muscle memory. The little brains in your fingers will will remember uh, the movements, and you can be, actually play it way faster that way than you thought you you could. Uh, and it's pretty amazing, actually. What I find with students is that when they try to play fast, not only do they start corrupting the rhythm, because they'll slow down and speed up depending on how easy or hard it gets, but they tense a lot and that becomes a habit. And that actually holds them back from playing, especially with finger picking, really quickly playing finger picking patterns very fast. A clenching habit keeps them from going fast and smooth. That's a good point. That's a good yeah. point. So one thing by going slow, you can avoid, and even if you feel the tension creeping in, you can stop, relax, and go back at it, and keep the tension from becoming a solid habit that you have to break later. 
Yeah, you can be more cognizant of it. If you're going really slow, then you're a lot. You can be a lot more aware of how your body feels. I used to really tense my shoulder up when I was doing classical guitar, and my teacher would kept on pushing my shoulder down. But I wasn't aware of it. I wasn't thinking of it. But if you slow things down and really think about it, then you'll have a lot more awareness of it. Or yeah, this is it. a common with students, and I'm often having to say, "No, come. <laughs> I know, but slow it down. Even practice just a little part and get it right, and then add it together." I know you want to play the whole thing so you can at least hear where you're going. Yeah. I, I do find too there is sometimes to push yourself a little bit. It's just not all the time and not most of the time. Sometimes it's good to just push yourself to see where your limits are and then back up to where you can really do it. I like to use the metronome and kind of actually gauge, you know, I'll write down, especially things, I'll pick specific things I want to work on and write down where I'm at, where I'm comfortable at and where's my push zone, yeah. where I can really push it but I can't quite get it right. And then I keep trying to push that whole thing up a little bit over time. Yeah, yeah, if you can dedicate to yourself to that type of practice and, and like you said, writing stuff down, then you can daily to see where you were last time or see weekly what your progress is and tempos that's the, the same you know correlating to our idea of starting slowly and bumping it up mm -hmm. um, you can actually visually see oh, I was playing this at 60 beats per minute and now a week later I'm playing at 72 and it's getting closer to whatever the tempo of the song is good Very cool yeah next question um, I have a live question for you guys for, from Richard uh, Richard says, can you go over the fingernail thing again versus not really hitting on your fingernail? Okay. Um, I think for mostly for acoustic guitar, especially for this style, mm -hmm. fingernails are not so much an issue. Probably you use the fleshy part of your pad. Yeah, I think I am hitting it with the, the fleshy part. I almost have the nail there as kind of like a backup just in case I'm off by a little bit. But from a classical perspective, if it was nylon strings, where would you hit, where would you hit it? <laughs> I don't play so much classical anymore. It's the flamenco Make thing. So I do have nails and I file them regularly. It's a lot of work actually. This is why I don't recommend it unless you really want to play this style of music. But I do and if I don't have nails it doesn't sound the same. What I'm doing is I'm hitting the string so that my finger, the flesh of my finger rolls off and hits the nail almost at the exact same time. So the note I'm getting is a little sharper than if I just do just nail it's a little more muted. Now on the steel string, I don't hear that big of a difference. That would be just nail, here at twangy, and that would be just flesh. In between, it's like that. It's kind of a full with a crisp bite to the top. Yeah. On the nylon, it's quite a significant difference. And yeah. if I'm playing melody on nylon, it's not gonna really be clear and cut through if I don't use that nail. But it takes quite a bit of practice to get the technique to where you're hitting right in the right spot all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's something I practice every day, working on just the and melodies. You, and you do have to be really dedicated to maintaining your nails. Yeah. I mean, I know just even I'm only I only have a little bit of a thumbnail, but but I know if I don't if I don't file pretty regularly and I get any type of angle on where uh, where the string would meet the yeah the finger, it'll it, catch. It, it'll catch, and that's no good. I mean, that's one I have to always watch. Is right there at the end of my thumb because yeah. it'll catch. But I actually go to a beauty parlor and have them about every couple of months put acrylic nails on here because I'm banging on the guitar wow. and it'll break my regular nails over time. Funny story, when I was playing classical guitar, I, I, I had to have an acrylic nail on my index finger because I used it for like, you know, going to the ATM and it would never, I always would break it and I couldn't, oh. couldn't grow it. <laughs> so I, I had all, all my nails for classical guitar except for this one and I had to have an acrylic. Yeah, acrylic, yeah. <laughs> All right, we have Paul who says, uh, as a new player, six months, can I or should I learn? Hi, Paul. <laughs> can I or should I learn both playing chords and finger picking or stay with one or the other? Hmm, good question. You can definitely incorporate both of them. Yeah, that's what um, I would say too. I would. The, the way I teach it is I, I, I'll teach, I have handouts that go through strumming and kind of gradually teach chords. Um, but then intermittently I'll just throw in like that basic pattern I put at the beginning. The first pattern is just getting used to using all of your fingers where you're playing the lowest note and then using index, middle, and ring. And then eventually I'll throw in another pattern where it's a different order of notes before I get into the real crazy ones like, like Dust in the Wind. I think it kind of makes learning chords a little more fun. It adds some variety to them. I'll even teach beginning students, if they want to learn finger picking, I don't force it if they just want to strum and sing. Yeah. But if they want, I'll teach them like 
partial chords. That sounds so good, just three notes, that's easy. Yeah. I think it's cool. I think it gives you a different perspective on how chords can be approached. Yeah. I think too, one thing that I do for my students on ukulele is um, I make sure that if they want to get into finger picking that we start with some chord stuff that they already know. Um, because one of the hardest parts about as a beginner, you don't want to start confusing your right hand and your left hand and trying to focus on both at the same time can be really That's challenging. That's a good point. So if you learn a basic chord progression, say one that, you, that you've that you been like working on for a while, you got your strum down, maybe start your finger picking with a progression that you know well already, yeah. so that way you're not struggling to look at your right hand and your left hand and figure out who's supposed to be going where. Um, and I would probably start off by not doing like moving bass lines or anything like no, that. No, very simple finger picking. Yeah, start with very simple. Um, and, and stay relaxed and get good technique. So exactly. Th so you're not kind of carrying forward bad habits into exactly. more complex patterns. And I would definitely, you know, like try, like I was saying, to make the finger picking the main event of what you're doing. Mm. So don't don't say, okay, I'm gonna do finger picking and I'm also gonna learn five new bar chords today and I'm gonna finger pick five new bar chords. Well, that's just unrealistic. Yeah. You know, start with a chord progression that you know and, and try the finger picking with something you know. And then as, you, as time goes on, you get more adjusted to learning chords and to finger point. picking, then it'll be easier. A lot of, a lot of um, thinking out how to learn something is how to break it down small enough to actually put attention on it. Because when you're trying to learn a bunch of things all at once, you usually can't quite make progress on any one area. So that's a good example of that. And if, you can, if you already got the chords and you want to add some finger picking to it, you're just focusing on the right hand. But if you're just learning the chords, now you're going back and forth. And that makes it difficult. Yeah. Um, we have one follow-up question uh, from Richard before I answer okay. another YouTube, uh, YouTuber. So Richard says, great, that helps. That was the question about a uh, fingernail thing. He says, when I do hit the fleshy part, I seem to hear the windings of the strings. Is that okay? Windings of the strings. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I'm not sure. You might be, you mean like scra Maybe. scraping uh, on the actual, on the bass string? The oh, the on, with the right hand? Yeah. Probably. If, it might be, I mean, if you're hearing that, it would be nail probably hitting it. I mean, the flesh, you shouldn't be hearing that very much if it's... And even that, that means you're like moving this way as opposed to straight up. Yeah. What I teach a lot, and, and you can tell me if you have a different way of approaching it, is I teach students when they're beginning finger picking, to think of the hand as the finger is just moving into the palm. Exactly. Not to move the hand out, and certainly not to move it around like this. Just gently pull into. And so I have them plant the finger and just pull into their palm. So in, in this way, whether it's there'd be no way to hear any noise because it's pulling directly into my palm, straight up. Yeah, great. Um, we have a YouTuber called The Hound. Hello, The Hound. The Hound. Um, I'm having a hard time making artificial harmonics on an acoustic guitar, specifically the picking hand part. You got any tips? <laughs> Heck of practice! <laughs> so, artificial harmonics, first of all, for everybody, this is an artificial harmonic on the 12th fret, it's the easiest place to do it. You put your finger lightly on the string, and then you hit the string. That's an artificial harmonic. Was he talking more about like fret, like fretted notes and then... Well, see, now that's the next level. Yeah. <laughs> this is a basic artificial <laughs> harmonic, and one of the easier ones. You could do it on the, the 7th and even the 5th, where it's harder. Um, this is fairly easy. Now there's a technique of putting your finger in the left hand and then using your, I use, let's see, let's see, I use my third finger and my first finger to hit the harmonic here. So I have to go up one fret from the 12th. I'm, I'm a little, I've done, I do it on nylon, never on steel string. Oh, that's it. But that's a difficult technique and for a beginner it's definitely not something I would start off with. No, um, I would just stick with the natural harmonics. Yeah, these are natural harmonics. Yeah. What's the difference between natural and artificial harmonics? I mean, like. He's talking about placing the finger in the left hand and making I a different see. note, and then using your right hand with both a picking, make it picking, and touching the string with the first finger uh, to make the harmonic. I so. It's <sighs> physics. Yeah, <laughs> it, it takes a lot of practice, and I, I'm sure you need a step-by-step method to get there. Even after years of classical guitar, I never got good at that. I could do it on specific songs because I kept doing it enough times. But um, I, I only have done on nylon string. I guess, I've, oh, people have seen it do on electric guitar because they got the amp. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was, I've been working on this uh, 
Van Halen acoustic song. And at the end of the song, you, you like. Oh, I've never like, done that. You like tap taps it. the harmonics, which is, I think, a, like a more accessible. Yeah. Kind of a. I'm not familiar with that. Probably a cheater way to do. A, but I think it would only work on electric harmonics. guitar, huh? Because you don't have enough volume on acoustic. Yeah, yeah. The song's on an acoustic. Oh, okay. But yeah, in a live situation, you probably wouldn't hear it at all. <laughs> That's new for me. I mean, I've seen people do it, but I've never tried it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have one more question from Shulamit. Uh, he says, here's another question. Let's say that I have a tune running around in my head. I sit down with the guitar <laughs> to find the chords. I discover that the key of C fits the tune except for one chord that isn't quite right with the standard chords, but seems to need some variation. How do I figure out what, what variation to use? There are so many variations of any chord that it seems to be almost an impossible task unless there are some definite guidelines. What do you suggest? Um, How would you answer that? I'd say, uh, say we're in the key of C. And say you are hearing that the chord is uh, some type of C, but as you mentioned, it's some type of variation. The note generally is going to be taken from the major scale, the relative major scale. So it would be from the... The C major scale. If you know your C major scale, then you're in business and you can start trying to add those notes and see if that's the variation that we're talking about. For instance, if I, this, this, is all, this kind of relates to dust in the wind. Uh, here's our C chord and here's our C major scale notes. Open B is in the C major scale and the second chord from dust in the wind uses that open B note. The third chord from Dust in the Wind. So you start with a C and then you use a variation. I think maybe that's what she's saying, a C major seven. So it's a variation on a C chord. I think so I wasn't yeah. sure what she meant by variation. Does she mean a variation in the fingering? Because you can play C in different places. Right. Or an actual, uh, how do we call it, extended chord. Yeah, like a suspended chord or an added chord. Yeah. yeah. So. so with a C chord, you could have a C major seven. Now you're starting to add notes to the chord. Yeah. Okay. You could, Shulamit, if you're on there, you could uh, uh, clarify if, if there's some, something in particular that we're talking about that either you want to hear more about or that we're on the right track. Yeah. Shulamit is here, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Shulamit. Some of them can be hard to find. I mean, in that case, you might need to like talk to a, a guitar teacher or something. Yeah. We're available. Uh, but there are like your standard ones, the most common, like, um, alternations like a D chord, adding your pinky, D sus4, D or D with an open first string, D sus2, you'll hear that a lot. So there's certain, there's a couple on guitar that are really common and the other ones can be a little bit harder to find but they're usually major scale notes. Yeah. A couple things I could think that might help are sort of elaborating on the idea for a Somebody who wants to write songs, which is something I, I do a lot, it really helps to know in, in any key that you're playing in the basic chords and then to know a few variations on those basic chords. So in the, in the key of C, it'd be C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor, B diminished is actually the appropriate chord for the key of C. The seventh, the seventh chord in the key is usually falls naturally as a diminished chord. So obviously I'm not going to go too much into depth on that. But the other thing is, I used to think that there was somehow a right chord and a not a right chord. But when you're writing songs, you get to decide, really. Most of what I do is I, I use some music theory and a lot of it is already inside me, so I'm not really thinking it out. But when push comes to shove, I'm using my ears and saying, is that the sound I want? And sometimes I have to play a few times because especially if I do something a little different, it's like tasting some different food. At first, it's strange, and I'm not sure if I like it or not, but there's a little inkling, well, maybe if I try it a little more, I might like it. So there's no exact one, that's the chord. Only you decide, actually, if that's the chord or not. Yeah, and, and to, to further that point, it could even be outside of the key, and there's all sorts yes. of rock songs, um, famous, famous, famous rock songs that have earned millions of dollars that are not um, chords that are all technically correct in the right key. So, you know, just follow your ear, really. What sounds good to you is really the most important thing. Definitely. 
Cool, and Shulamit says, thanks, I get the idea. I, I like what Vince said, and she uses sus chords a lot. So. Yeah, sus chords are, yeah. sound good on acoustic guitar. Good. Uh, we have um, a YouTuber, Lady Della, I think is the name on here, ah. um, says, Mike Dawes does this beautifully, meaning the tapping on the acoustic, like you were talking about. Um, I believe he has a pickup to amp the sound, so there's just mm. a little fun fact for you. Ah. Um, we have another question from Ann Thompson. Who says, Thomas, I am a student of yours. I am. Do you have chord charts on your website? Some of these are confusing me. I learned a G a different way, but the way you teach it sounds better. So just a little guidance about chords. I have a lot of chord charts on the website. And the website is in more orderly fashion. So even though I will teach you one form of G, later on I will teach you another and another. I just don't pile them all at one time. In other words, I don't think it would be much good for me to write out all the chords and send them to all my students and just totally overwhelm them. If you can't use the chords, it's like learning a bunch of words and not knowing how to put them together into sentences. So if you follow the path, you're going to learn all of this stuff, actually. <laughs> Later on, it goes through step by step, all the beginning, a basic G chord. I often teach, believe it or not, this four finger G chord. Yeah. I used to not do that. I used to teach a three finger G chord. but. A lot of people find it easier when you can put the third and the pinky together to it. But yes, there are several forms of G, and this one is the other very valuable form, which you, you will learn in, I think, the fourth or fifth adventure. <laughs> Anne says giggles. Thank you. <laughs> and, and to finish that up, everywhere along those lessons, when I introduce new chords up, I give you the written chord chart and a PDF sometime with the music. Yeah, very cool. I think that's all the questions we have for now. So we're going to run this raffle. And for those of you that are listening, if you have any other questions, throw them on here real quick before we close up for today. So the raffle, uh, we have on our Real Guitar Success membership site a series of 20 lessons every month. They're practice sessions. So the idea is they're released one a day during the weekday, and students get a chance to practice those sessions a minimum of 10 minutes. They can spend longer, of course, and even save them. But at the end of the month, who's, those who have completed all 20 practice sessions, spent at least 10 minutes on each session, get entered into a raffle to win a $50 Amazon gift card. And Felix pulled the winner for today. Okay, let me know. It's Larry. Larry, congratulations, Larry. Larry Griffith. Hi, yes. Larry. Hi, Larry. And if you're, if you're seeing this, I don't know if you're on here live. So we'll be sending you the Amazon gift card. And for all of you who've completed it, the real winner is, depending how much you got out of the lessons, because playing guitar is a lot better than any amount of money. Well, maybe not any. <laughs> I'll have to rethink that one. But <laughs> you got the idea. So that's it for today. No more questions? Yep, that's it for now. I want to thank you all for joining me today and for having Vince with us. Thank you, Vince. Yeah, that was fun. Me. And I, I think I want to lesson on those tapping. I don't have to talk about that. Thank you, Ami and Felix. Yay. We'll be back next month. It will go back to Tuesday. We had a shift at this month for a trip that we're taking. So we'll be back next month, Tuesday, I believe. The I'm first, looking to make sure. Yes, the first, <laughs> the first Tuesday, Tuesday of time. next month at 12 noon Pacific Daylight Time. Bye for now. See you Bye. next month.